we're going to do is if you guys have questions on the sidebar, please just throw them in there. I'd love to hear what you guys have. We've, we've got a pretty good question list that we both collaborated on and uh, we'll get, we'll get to most of those, I think. But if you guys have any questions, I'd love to hear your thoughts too. It's always fun to have some interaction as far as that goes, but Tyler, welcome to the show and, and really ready to excited. Or re I'm really excited to get to know you a little bit better today. Jonathan, greatly appreciated. I've heard a lot of good things about the podcast. I've listened to bits and pieces of some episodes, so thrilled to be on, really excited about it. And uh, this conversation, I'm sure, like you mentioned, there's a couple questions. I'm sure it'll be very nonlinear in nature. I kind of bounce around a little bit. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, you know, keep everybody engaged. Yeah. So appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me on. Of course, of course. So for our listeners who, uh, again, you, I don't want to say that you're new to the baseball world because you're not, but you're someone that I recently started following and started digging into. I, I heard you on Rob Gray's podcast, which is fantastic. And I was like, man, I got to get this guy on the show. I, th I think one of uh, one of the guys that's in here, Connor Gunn, was like, dude, he's legit. Like he's he's a good guy, a good guy to get on the show. Uh, but for me and our guests to, to get to learn you a little bit better, can you give us a short snapshot of how you decided to get into not only coaching, but coaching baseball as well? Well, for me, it, it started probably, you know, no different than a lot of you on the call is just kind of passionate about movement, passionate about sports, kind of just the feeling, the engagement, the joy that comes along with it, you know, as a, as a, you know, a young kid growing up. And so, you know, I was going to be, I was going into law enforcement. I actually have a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. And I, I was, I went to school actually not too far from where you're located there at Northeastern State University in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. And nice. um, I, I was just 100% going to be a law enforcement agent. But then after the NFL dream died a little bit, I had a couple opportunities in 2005. Um, I, I was just needing something more. And fortunately, I'd taken a lot of a, uh, undergrad elected, you know, elective classes that were uh, relevant, I guess, to, to human, human behavior and nutrition and whatnot. And so moved in in 2006 to doing my master's degree in kinesiology. And uh, for me, I, I've done a lot of different things. I, my target sport and main sport I work with is American football. Uh, I say American football because I do work with Canadian football players as well. Uh, but baseball has been a passion of mine. It was actually what I was going to play in college prior to going and playing football. I found out football was a full ride at that time. And, and so I, I took that opportunity. But for me, coaching really came down to uh, I was a decent athlete, but cared more about the game and investigating the behaviors that uh, emerge within the game of the sports and baseball, football, whatever it may be. So with, you know, with where I am right now, I, I am in a baseball facility um, in Minnesota called Starter Sports Training. I took the position along with a colleague of mine, Rich White, uh, just about nine months ago. And, and we've been kind of moving towards, and one of the main reasons I actually took the position is uh, they are firmly committing to an ecological approach to learning and uh, making sure that we are all kind of on the same page. That way we're not pulling the athlete in two different directions as far as, because we're all stepping into the learning space. So for me, I took that position because it was going to allow us to create this uh, co-adaptive relationship amongst the coaches as well as the actual athletes and players themselves. And then um, I, I do uh, my evening time and my, and my weekend times are spent through emergence and uh, we're a sport movement skill education company. I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit, but yeah, so kind of yeah, started as a young kid and then grew. That's awesome. And I love that. And, and it, it just furthers my point that uh, all good people have Oklahoma ties. So I'll firmly entrench you in that uh, as well. But we, uh, this should be no surprise to you since you, you spent some time here, but we were in a tornado watch last night. So that was a good time. And yeah, I uh, uh, yeah, I was on a zoom call with, with, uh, <laughs> with, with two other guys that had, a, that one went to OU and one went to OSU and they're like, hey, I don't miss that at all. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I completely get it. But when, whenever we're talking about, uh, an ecological approach to learning. Again, most of our listeners, at least the listeners that I have from my base, uh, from a, from a podcast standpoint, maybe not the guys that are listening today. Uh, but what does that, what does that mean? Like, can you, so I feel like as in the baseball world, we're making progress towards some, you know, some different ecological prospect or just di ecological concepts, uh, some nonlinear pedagogy concepts. And those are some terms that have only been recently introduced to our world since it's, it's an old sport. And so, uh, can you kind of, can you kind of wa like walk through what ecological approach to learning means? Like when you say that? No, I, I certainly can. It's, it's interesting because these, these principles have been around for a while and, and intuitively good coaches have been using aspects of them for quite some time. And I, I don't want to get too much in unless the listeners want to get too much into the extremely, you know, in-depth knowledge as far as like per, uh, perception, direct perception, indirect perception. But a lot of this really lives in 
uh, ecological psychology, which is one of the underpinning theories that supports a, a, a ecological dynamics approach. So it's dynamical systems and ecological psychology. So ecological psychology is essentially how we as humans interact with the world around us and uh, viewing it as the functional act of picking up information. So information is essentially the energy sources that we're interacting with as humans around us and what we can do with that information or how that information channels how we move. That information can be the balls that are available, they can be the sizes of uh, the balls, the weights, the bats, the uh, weather systems, all of that kind of um, has influence or shapes the way in which our behavior emerges. And that ecological psychology, that picking up that information, I'm kind of blending the two as I'm explaining this here, is also with dynamical systems theory. So it's essentially the interconnectedness of how systems organize and self-organize in uh, different ways. And they organize based off of the constraints. And that's a term that's used quite often in a lot of sports, but mm -hmm. I think it's uh, sometimes in, in a lot of ways misused. Essentially constraints are, they're not prescribing a solution. And, and that's where I think the confusion comes in sometimes. It's more eliminating an option or reducing an option from occurring that way a different behavior emerges. So we're, we're not like prescribing, this is the action we want to have happen. It's more, we are having a, you know, let's call it a barrier in place or something in place that is going to channel the emergence of a different behavior. So ecological psychology at its, at its purest, it views um, athletes, sports teams, and it's not just exclusive to that. I mean, this is not just in the sporting world, but it views athletes and sport teams as complex adaptive systems. And we as systems, have different emergent tendencies or behaviors based off of what constraints are available. So the constraints are innings, like I said, they're, they're pitch counts, they're the weights of the bats. There are a lot of different things that are going to channel the way a human system organizes their behavior based on the information they're connecting to. So that's where that ecological psychology part comes in. And last bit, and we can move past the extremely nerdy part is, is it looks into like theories of motor learning. So from an ecological dynamics point of view, motor learning is viewed as um, essentially something that is adapted, continually adapted over time. It's not something that's fixed or permanent to where we've compartmentalized and stored every action that could potentially have happened in, in life in, a, in the brain somewhere. Rather, it views the brain as part of a larger system. And the system is, is you know, entirely responsible through the interactions that occur with the environment for the behavior or the action that then emerges. So that's where you okay. really have that importance. So that's the sure. in-depth answer or shorter answer, actually. <laughs> well, I, I love that. And, and again, I, I didn't want to get like 40 minutes in and somebody going, man, what is, what is he even talking about? So we should have had like a, we should have sent out like a definition uh, Encyclopedia Britannica uh, for myself too. But well, we do um, have a movement terminology cheat sheet that is available for, nice. Uh, for coaches through emergence. So if you get on, follow us online, uh, that's, you know, that's accessible as well. That way it kind of makes some of these ideas, like I said, mm -hmm. a lot of coaches have been using some of them. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll try and put that in the show or I will put that in the show notes. So uh, one thing that, that you mentioned, and I, I know that this one has, is, has been really popularized in baseball in the last couple of years, and that's the use of constraints. Mm -hmm. And you talked about uh, some, some different aspects of what that mean, meant to you. And I, I guess I'm, I may be trying to simplify it as, as best I can. And I, I just think it's, uh, for me, it's set up, in, you're setting up a problem and you're trying to let them find the solution. So it's almost like you're giving them a roadmap. You're saying, you're here, uh, we wanna go here. Now, here's the best way, or you can find the best way to be able to, to accomplish this task based on you know so many different, like you said, ecological uh, aspects. But uh, is, is that kind of, you know, again, that's a simpleton answer, but that's just the, the best way that I can use to describe the way that I've used constraints. Is that, is that more of a more of a like me putting my own spin on it and our baseball world putting our own spin on it or is that how constraints are actually supposed to be used Jonathan that's probably one of the best descriptions of of problem solving in sport and search that I've heard in from the baseball world quite frankly uh, you're you're you know you're spot on in the fact that oh, it is you. essentially the search uh, for the the appropriate action and that appropriate action is essentially not something like I said that we're kind of retrieving from memory it's more the the interactions that occur between the information that is currently available. And so, you know, that's where, that's where when we start speaking to context and the importance of context, it doesn't have to be, and quite frankly, shouldn't be a 10 all the time. I know if we just relied on the game as being the teacher, yeah, of course, that's going to be great for emergent tendencies to occur between the, you know, the opposing players. But at the same time, that can be information overload a lot of times. That can be too complex for the system. 
And so our job as, as environment architects, like you were just explaining, or problem right. setters or problem love that. designers, you know, that's, that's kind of the terms that you were just using. It's exactly what it is, is the fact that we are essentially creating situations. Um, I use the term often slices or snippets, uh, specifically for American football, creating slices of the game. You know, and if we look at it, um, you know, on a representative level of sports scale, let's say it's a six on a representative level of sports scale. Um, if we create that situation, we're allowing for the athlete to then search. Um, and they're, they're searching based off of the, uh, the tendencies that arise between what their stable patterns are. Um, I think a lot of times it's, it's, or it's been growing in the baseball world that the term ad, uh, attractors. Attractors mm -hmm. are essentially right. stable patterns of, of organization. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that that's the appropriate attractor state. Um, you know, we, we can nudge that or essentially, you know, guide that um, attractor to kind of drop into a different attractor state. But essentially, uh, we're creating these environments and we're creating these environments that way the athlete themselves can search. And the beautiful part about what you just described there was this is about the athlete. This, this is not just the coach has all answers and it's the same answer for every single athlete. I do the same capital D drill one after the other, after the other. And that in fact is going to make every person better. Oh, Cause one thing I think we have to remember is we all perceive things differently. And so even as coaches being in the game a long time, that doesn't mean our perceptions are what 14 year old Johnny's perceptions are. So we can't expect the action to then emerge in the same way because perception action couplings um, are tightly interwoven and interconnected and shouldn't be separated. No, fantastic answer. And, and I think that, that what precedes everything and something that we, we wanted to talk about first, and that's the performer environment relationship. Like, and for me, when I think of a relationship, I'm thinking about, okay, we got to build trust with them first too. Uh, but whenever we're talking about that, um, let's say that, you know, I'm, I'm coming to you guys and, and I'm a, you know, 20 year old pitcher or just baseball player in general, just kind of take us through what that first meeting would look like, because for you to best, to best help me, you've got to get to know me, what my strengths, what my weaknesses are, how you can best help, how I think. Uh, the different things that I know why I play. So all of those things proceed, even prescribing drills potentially, or maybe you put them through some different things to see how they react. But talk to us a little bit about that performer environment relationship. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a combination of things. You just described kind of two aspects of it, which is, which is wonderful. You're, you're talking about that coach athlete or that you mm -hmm. know, coach active right. relationship. And that part is vitally important because the, the better we get to know our athletes, the, the better we're going to be able to help them. Because we can't just have all the answers, like I mentioned earlier. We do need to get to know kind of what their tendencies are. You know, do they have great limiters such as just sheer strength capabilities? You know, is that something that's limiting their performance, even though their ability to pick up spin on balls and whatnot is, is vitally or is, or is very successful? You know, they're good at that, but they can't hit the ball very far. So that might be something that is limiting their performance. And that's where you're working with uh, your traditional SNC coaches to help develop that. Or it could be something that is more. Um, a, you know, a, a cognitive limitation or an attention limitation to where they're not exactly sure in that situation what they should be aiming to interact with. Because through an ecological, I love that. kind of how we view cognitions are viewed as intentions. You know, my, it's a, it's a one, two count. There's a, there's a runner. I'm, I'm a lefty. So there, there's a runner that's maybe on third and I'm looking to pull the ball because there's one out. I want to get the run home. You know, it's, it's that my intention is to try to pull the ball. How am I aiming to interact with the information in the environment? So one thing is, is I'm getting to know that, that athlete, that, that athlete coach relationship is vitally important, like I mentioned, but the perform environment relationship is very much about a mutual relationship. It's that it's essentially the acknowledgement of um, what is available for pickup does matter. And so we can't just have our drills that are occurring in a vacuum all the time and that we're expecting those then to just then uh, unfold the same way in the real world. So essentially that's where uh, you hear the word context all the time. You know, context is essentially what shapes the content. And uh, there's friends of ours that have shared that. that. And so anyways, with that being said, context shapes the content. And that's important. And that's where that mutuality exists um, between the performer and environment relationship. All right. So we've, we are 20 minutes in and we are just scratching the surface on the different stuff that we're going to talk about today, which, uh, man, I could sit here and do this all day. I love this. Um, but let's talk about... Um, I guess the, the first question that I really have, we hear the term self-organize thrown around a lot and that's, that's right in line. And, and you mentioned it earlier, but 
whenever I first started studying this stuff, I was like, Oh, cool. Well, we'll just set this up and then they'll figure it out. And then I'll be the world's best coach. And then it'll just be like, Hey, figure, figure it out, you know? And, and then I didn't realize the flip side of that. Well, what if they self-organize in a way that we don't want them to? And I was like, Oh God, that's not, that's not exactly what I intended at all. And so, um, one of those coaching moments that you're left scratching your head, which I'm sure we all have had those from time to time. And, and the more that we do, I think the better the coaches that we're going to be. But uh, can you hit on that a little bit? Because I, again, I think that it's one of those uh, one of those terms that you hear a lot, and it, it sounds so easy, but it's not that easy. I mean, just hit on that for us a little bit. So the constraint slit approach. I'm going to start there, and I'm not going to go too deep into it. We can touch on it a little bit in a second. But the sure. idea of the constraint slit approach is to facilitate the process of self organization. That that's kind of like the main underlying idea of that. And so we talked about the athlete or the co-adaptive relationship between the coach and the athlete. And the reason why that's so important is, is from an ecological approach, this isn't just a let them figure it out. I mean, certainly there is the need for exploration and search specifically early on, because we, we want the athlete to interact with a rich landscape of opportunities. You know, those opportunities can be a number of outside pitches that are thrown. That way they can start to get that, you know, the term in baseball you use often is feel, that feel to be able to go the opposite way. Uh, but with that, we don't want this to be where we're constraining to constrain in the fact that we are just throwing it on the outside and that's all we're doing. The athlete knows that pitch is coming. Rather, kind of mixing the pitches across the plate a little bit, essentially scaling that information. So that self-organization, we're there as the coach to facilitate that. So what does that mean? Um, and, and Jacobs and Michaels or Jacobs and Michaels in 2007, they have a paper called Direct Learning. And Direct Learning talks about education of intention. So essentially how I aim to interact. I gave an example okay. earlier about it being a, you know, there's one out to one, maybe it's a one, two count, mm -hmm. two, two count, whatever the count may be. I, I'm looking sure. to pull them all to the opposite field to get that runner home based off of the situations. And then the education of attention might be where my search is. Whereas we, as a coach, where are we helping educate their attention it might be something like arm slot. You know, what does the arm slot look like? Does the, does the pitcher have their emergent tendencies? Maybe something like they, they have a slight drop in their arm slot when they, throw, when they throw a particular pitch. So through the analyzing of film um, as coaches and then as athletes, we can start to pick up on, and that's where that pick up on that information that is going to, you know, allow us to uh, coordinate and control, regulate our actions too. So as a coach, in simple, you know, in simple ways, I'm not just standing back. There may be times where that may, you know, that may occur, certainly early on in the offseason, certainly with mm -hmm. younger learners, you're just allowing for that search and exploration because that's, that's how we learn as humans. But as the, as the season you know, draws near and then as uh, learners are needing to interact with certain opportunities, that's where we set up problems for that to occur. So in the example, give you one, exa one more example. Let's say I have, um, a pitcher that really struggles throwing in, in opposing, um, you know, pitchers are opposing teams ballparks. That could be for a variety of different reasons. It could be because the backstop has different depth that's available. There's different colors that are available. It could be the crowd mm -hmm. noise that is occurring. It could be the fact that the team that they're playing um, is a good hitting team. So they pitch from the, uh, the stretch often. So as a coach, mm -hmm. I am, I'm not just kind of haphazardly letting them do whatever. I'm setting up situations where they may need to throw from the stretch more often. They may, may need to throw with a little bit more pressure and anxiety because if we facilitate the process of self-organization, we are in fact trying to design a learning environment that has those aspects of that information available. That way that they're able to start to form, uh, even, even if it's uh, subtly formed, those attractor wells or those stable states of coordination. That way it then can emerge in a similar way when they perceive that information that they need to become attuned to. Sure. And, and just to add to that for, again, it's, it's, you're in this world every day and then I'm taking, okay, how do we use this in baseball? How do we use these concepts in baseball? So that's, that's always how like my translator, right? And so one thing that, that I'm thinking about this too, is, is whenever you're setting up the environment and whenever you're the facilitator, they're the ones that are learning. You're not telling them, they're not just listening to you talk. And so I think that that's, that's, you may have, it may have hit on that a little bit, but that's just something that whenever you're setting up an environment and you are the facilitator, I think that's where they are learning to go through these different problems and that, that in turn helps them to self-organize. And then whenever they are in those situations in a game, uh, which uh, I love the, the very specific uh, situations that you are putting them in, uh, because you think they're going to, they're going to see those. Uh, then they're not, they're not unfamiliar to it and they're not looking to you for advice. 
precise precisely you actually said uh, two two golden things there first one was is that uh, i believe the way you said it was they are they're interacting with those problems essentially mm -hmm. that's the that's the process of search you know i'm not trying to you know bernstein you guys have probably heard of uh nikolai bernstein if you, if you haven't certainly certainly uh, look him up but um you know, you're not looking to repeat the means of a solution. I'm just trying to hit that same ball, the same spot, same time, one after other it becomes rote repetition. Um, you know, I'm not sensitive to really to any information in the environment. Rather, it's the process of solving that problem time and time again in subtly different ways. Um, so you can do the second thing you mentioned was essentially attuned. You mentioned a high sensitivity to what I likely will experience. And so uh, w one thing I want to mention is, is one of the biggest faults that I still have, I'm getting better at it, but I, I still have, and I was really struggled with early on as a young coach was just dumping copious amounts of information mm -hmm. into the learning environment to the point to where, you know, they, they didn't even know what they were interacting with because sure. instruction is, is a form of an informational constraint. Mm -hmm. So if I am essentially getting them to the point to where they're like, coach, what did you, what did you even want me to do? Or wh wh where am I looking? Or if we, if we do that, we can actually be calling, causing more harm than good. And so that doesn't mean though, that we can't point them in the right direction per se, or essentially educate their intention, but it can be done through task and environment design. So if I have a hitter that does struggle, let's say hitting uh, in disadvantage counts, I may want to exaggerate um, those opportunities or the term in the ecological psychology, those, those affordances. So I want to exaggerate those opportunities. How as a coach can I then allow them to interact with hitting in a disadvantage count often because they may do that quite often in a game, but it may happen four times in a game. Well, I don't want to rely on those four times to just be the only time they learn or they have an opportunity to learn. So when I'm designing in those at disadvantage counts, it may be to where you know, maybe I only have myself, I have um, another hitter that is present that's maybe part of a, a, you know, a, two of them that are doing a private lesson. I might do something simple as have one of the hitters stand behind the plate and call balls and strikes. Sure. And I know it sounds crazy, but one of the reasons why is because that adds that extra level of anxiety or pressure of, I can't just be not uh, perceptually aware of what is going on. And so the hitter has another constraint that's applied. And then as the session intention that day or the task even intention might be, we're going to work on hitting the ball in a one, two count or in a disadvantage count. But with that, that doesn't mean that you can't, as the coach, we can't be like, okay, it's a one, one count here. And you've got ball flight information from the coach. You've got spin that's occurring. That way they can become attuned to that spin. You've got the added pressure of the, of the umpire that's calling balls and strikes as a stand in. And so now they're getting a chance to interact with the ball that's being moved to different parts of the plate in a disadvantage account that way that they are aiming to interact or their intentions, you know, in a certain way, along with their attention or their essentially their search process that is, that is occurring. So that's, that's an example of how it can truly be used. And hopefully the listeners out there are picking up on the fact that there are ways to, to scale or slide that information dial to where it's even more complex. And there are also as, aspects or ways in which you can make it less complex if you have a younger learner maybe that balls and strikes, maybe that's too complex for them at that time. So that's where we need to be aware of that co-adaptive relationship. Well, I think that, you know, the interesting thing that uh, it comes out of this is there are some different aspects that we as baseball and, and some softball coaches that are with us that we've done over time that fit within these frameworks. Maybe we didn't do them as well either. Uh, but there are some that, that I think, like I think of like the balls across the plate where it's like one through seven and you want to hit, you know, between a, a certain thing. I mean, we still did that this spring training and, and the players loved it. Uh, another one, and this is again, so going from high school to pro, I had some preconceived, you know, things of, okay, so these are things that we're not going to do. And one of them was like the, the baseball with the black line that shows you whether or not you're actually throwing a four seam uh, and, and have proper backspin. And it was immediate feedback but we did that in spring training. I was like, this is, this is crazy. We did this in like fourth grade whenever I was in fourth grade. And, the, and some of our players were like, this is so cool. We've never done this before. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so crazy. But you got, again, you got to understand the information that you're giving. And uh, another one that, that I haven't really seen it a lot. I love the umpire one. I, I think that's a, that's a fantastic one. Uh, but another one is we had these, um, these things from Oats specialties and they were basically like a, a strike zone for pitchers to throw their, their side pins with, and they had a big white dot and then it's just a, like the middle of the strike zone. And so during BP, we would just put that as the catcher 
uh, or just right behind them as the, as the middle of the zone. And any time that they would take a fastball in which we were throwing and it would hit it, then they would lose their round. And so they not only I, – I not only had something to throw to, which was nice, but then that gave them immediate feedback on if they didn't swing. And they got to hear the sound because it's, it's like got these metal pipes and it would just go ping like every single time. So now they're hearing that and they're going, oh, my God, okay, get out of the cage. So those are, just, those, those are just a couple of things that, wow. that, I've, that I've walked across that, that hopefully add to what you're saying. I, I don't mean to take over the conversation by any means. No, 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 no. I, 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 love, love, the fact you, I love the fact you added that. You actually just touched on one of the main underpinning principles of a, a nonlinear pedagogy in general, which is essentially having consequences that are present. And those consequences can exaggerate that behavior that then emerges. And you just talked about having that pinging that occurs. Um, that, that right there is going to shape behavior in a different way and, and, and oftentimes in a more uh, contextual way simply because they, they can't just sit there and wait for the pitch per se that they're looking for or they're wanting because they don't have 100 strikes that are available for them at that time. And so that, that in and of itself, uh, those uh, key performance inhibitors sometimes are essentially anxiety, fatigue, pressure. Uh, we do need those, those athletes to interact with those. And so that, that's a beautiful way to describe it because – as, as a coach, that doesn't mean that I didn't help them. I just helped them in a different way than me just, you know, that copious information that we talked about. And so that's, that's key there. You, you did bring up another point. I won't go too far into this because I'm actually doing a, a podcast with, with Rob Gray on Thursday about perspective control. Oh, and nice. you just mentioned, you just mentioned um, uh, the black line around the ball. And essentially, with, with perspective control, it's, uh, I'm not predicting where a ball is going to land, per se that I am utilizing information that is available at that moment in time to have my end defector or my bat line up with where the ball may be. And it's going to change based off of my movement because when I move, I'm perceiving information. And it's essentially guiding my action online in real time. But mm -hmm. I only bring it up because uh, they're in this paper that we're actually going to be talking about on Thursday. The st some of the studies that were done were with volleyball players and with the actual ball itself. And that um, athletes would have less displacement. So essentially, they were moving laterally uh, with less uh, movement whenever the ball was colored or even partially colored because it was essentially uh, giving away the spin, you know, potentially of what was going to happen mm -hmm. versus it being an entirely white ball. And that white ball was harder to perceive the spin. And so there was more movement. And the movement can be either our bodies um, or it can be a bat or a racket or something like that. And so that goes back to that need for interacting with those opportunities. Mm -hmm. And they need to become attuned to that information. That way our perceptual systems are sensitive to it. And sure. that's, what, that's really what we're wanting. And what you're saying, that's a great, great example because we're needing to be sensitive as we move into the season. And the last thing I'll, I'll mention real quick before we transition is, is um, you, you, you can look at it as a scale. Um, there's, a, there's general you know, movements and there's, there's specific. I actually prefer less specific and, and more specific. And then there's a, there's a bit at the end that I, I probably would chop off and not even interact mm -hmm. with per se. And if I'm doing something like, like hitting off of a T all of the time, or even a, a vast majority of the session, um, we have to start thinking about the perception action couplings that are being formed, what they're perceiving, how they're interacting. Is that relevant? for what they're going to be doing on game day. And yes, the listeners out there are probably thinking, well, Tyler, it doesn't matter based off their age. And it does. But there are ways to scale the constraints or scale the information in order for them to still perceive spin, perceive ball flight. So that's where we start getting into lighter implemented bats, uh, larger balls for younger individuals, potentially even a bounce that is, that is, you know, while you wouldn't have a bounce necessarily that is occurring in a game, you still have ball flight that is occurring. So now you're a little bit less specific. So we're, we're scaling that specificity that way that someone can perceive information directly in the environment. Oh, great, great answer. And, and again, thank you for adding that. Uh, but, but again, so in my career, I feel like I, I ebb and flow and, and the older I get, the more that I want to stay in the middle. So at one point I was like, man, teas suck. Like teas are awful. Like they're just the worst thing ever. And then I started thinking about it. Okay. So, psychologically, if they want to use the tea to warm up because it makes them feel good, does it have value? And so I, I wanted to ask you that too. I mean, I, I know we don't want to stay on it the entire time, but you know, 24 year old me, I would have gone, Oh, we'll just get rid of the tea and not use it at all without taking into account. They may need that as far as part of their, okay, warm up process. Let me make sure that I have that immediate feedback that I need from the tea. So I, then I can move on. And, 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 and again, being in, and I, the only reason I say this is because they're the best in the world, but seeing how many 
professionals use the tea just to get themselves warmed up and ready to go. It's amazing, you know? And, and so again, you, we don't want to stay on that the entire time, but I also, I started to think about, okay, if this is, if the best guys in the world are using this as, as kind of a, a, a immediate feedback loop, which I'd love to get into here in just a second, but also they're using it as a warm up to get their mind ready to get their body feeling right, then it must have some value. So what are your thoughts on that? Big question. Uh, big, big, big question. Let's uh, carve out about half an hour. No, I'm just kidding. We, we can touch on it briefly. <laughs> okay. um, a, a couple of things. I think you, I want to first start with, you may th- mention the psychological aspect of it, essentially like the feeling good and warming up. I, I certainly think the tea can exist there. No, no question. I mean, you do have to warm the tissues up and it might be sometimes scaling that information is scaling it to the point to where I don't have all of those pressures, anxieties, and fatigues of an actual uh, pitcher throwing to me and whatnot. So there is a need and can be certainly a place for it there. Uh, second thing I'll mention is we can't just look at it, and I'm not challenging you by any means, but we can't just look at what the best in the world are doing because they grew up in a time frame Very or true. years of that's just what we that's just what you do. Because right. if we evaluate in 75 years from now what people are doing, I'd be willing to put a lot of money on the fact that far fewer professionals are using the T simply because that's what the norm is now changing to not having that occur as often. Sure. Uh, with that being said, and most of you that are, that are on the podcast that have heard me speak before, um, I'll try to be respectfully direct with it. I don't think the tea has very much place. I, I, I don't think it should be thrown out by any means, but I think if we look at it on where its value is, um, you know, I can give some specific examples, one of which you just gave, like the cycle mm-hmm. on warming up, the kind of feeling good, loosening up a little bit, kind of maybe being more relaxed. Mm-hmm. I think it can certainly uh, be in play at some points. Uh, for younger individuals that maybe aren't strong enough to wield certain bats. And so they, they need to be able to, to use a tee to, to facilitate that part of it where they can get their bat through a zone. But I th- think we need to ask ourselves, if we, if we are limited to time, which everybody on the call and everybody listening, everybody that will listen, I, I would imagine would agree that, yes, we all have time as a constraint. And mm-hmm. so if that is, in fact, the case, and this goes back to what we talked about early on in the call of knowing our athletes and knowing kind of where their challenge point is, that if we're limited by that time and we need our athletes to interact with at least something that's a little bit more contextual for some of the time, and then as the season approaches, they need to be attuned to relevant information. The T doesn't provide a ton of relevant information because once again, you don't have arm slot, you don't have the inning present, there's not balls and strikes, the ball's not moving. And so there are a lot of aspects of it that, um, and who was, I believe it was Krauss and colleagues, have spoken to actually, I think I believe it was Ross Pender and colleagues have spoken to the fact we can become attuned to the uh, wrong information or non-specifying sure. information as well. And so we need to keep that in mind based off the time. So uh, the facility where I am, we're getting ready to move into, we'll touch on this a little bit, probably uh, we're getting ready to move into where they're going to be filling out a checklist that essentially doesn't tell them what to do. It just kind of shapes the way that they select their activities for their athletes based off their relationships. And uh, one of them, you know, if they violate uh, a, a number of the principles from an ecological approach, then, then they will potentially have to check that T out, meaning that they'll mm-hmm. have a time limitation that they can use it and they have to justify the why behind they selected it. Because that's the thing I would challenge all the listeners out there. I have to do it to myself and I by no means am perfect. I, you know, I, I make mistakes all the time, but why was that activity selected? And what was the athlete able to search and interact with? And if it's, information that is often not going to be in the game, then doesn't mean it needs to be thrown away. So it doesn't mean the teeth needs to be thrown away, but mm-hmm. could I find a way for them to interact with hitting an outside pitch or an inside pitch more often that has at least a little bit of ball flight, even if it's from a, a soft front toss, you know, soft toss or, you know, a slow overhand toss. And mm-hmm. if that is in fact the case, then maybe we should at least spend a little bit of time there and then move towards some higher contextual activities. Sure. No, I couldn't have put it better. I, I th- thank you for going into some uh, some detail with that. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, another thing that that I, I've really I, I've wanted to do for so long, but I've I've never been able to to do it. And uh, so a couple of years ago, I started reading up on soccer coaches and Anson uh, Anson Durant's or Dorrance, however you want to say it. Uh, he started these different competitive cauldrons and soccer has done small sided games for a long time to try and teach not only competitive ness but to teach what they do in games with um uh, with actual live action and time and speed and and a lot of times they just condense the space 
And so I, I have always wanted to do that because then you've got a lot of different things going on, which are teaching them what they want to do. I think football does a pretty good job of this too. Whenever you break up into your individual groups, you can do this too. And then you come back and then you're seven on seven and then you finally go into team defense. And, and I love that, but I don't think baseball, we've really done that yet. Uh, so any, any advice on, it doesn't have to be like competitive cauldron type thing, but just on for small sided games, which, which are a learning experience that are competitive that also translates? Great question. I, I think first uh, for those out there that, I mean, I think we've all probably heard small sided games, but some of the, some of the reasons behind the why there, a uh, couple things. Number one is you're, you're manipulating spatial temporal aspects of it. So the space and time that is being manipulated. Uh, if I need to move the ball through tight spaces, uh, you know, oftentimes with defenders that are, that are you know, converging very rapidly, such as in soccer that you gave as an example, uh, that's where a lot of times those situations were born. Could have also been born because of uh, situations that they're living in, the conditions in which the places in the world that they play. You know, they may have not had aspects to where they could play in with larger spaces on a regular basis. So, uh, you know, that, that was maybe one of the reasons why. The other thing is, is that uh, we talked about kind of facilitating the process of self-organization or essentially having the athlete interact with information that is likely going to be present in the game. And there are a lot of times in games such as soccer game, as an example, to where they are down near the penalty box and there's a lot of bodies that are in one space. And so if I need to be able to uh, interact with balls that are traveling at high speeds at different heights, uh, you know, having essentially the shared relationship between myself and my offensive player, as well as the kind of the space and time difference between where the defender is, that's the need for the small side of games. And, and you're right to where they, they kind of have existed in football. Mm -hmm. um, so I gave an example earlier, and I'm going to get to the baseball part. I gave an example earlier of like snippets or slices, essentially scaling the information. So an example would be right before we all got shut down, uh, there, there are not a ton of football players that are back right now. And so that being my main target sport, there are times where it's just a 1v1 or a 1v2. So, you know, you as a coach can assign a number to that as far as a representative level of sport, but it might be a three or a four or a five. I know it's not a seven, eight, nine or 10, and I might not want it to be at that time, but that would be kind of like a little bit of a small sided game in a way, just simply because um, I'm trying to create that slice of that game. That way the athlete can interact with those options, you know, mm -hmm. quite often in baseball. We've already kind of touched on a few examples, which is essentially whether it's for the pitcher, whether it's for the hitter, um, whether it's specifically for either one whether it is for the catcher or potentially let's say it's um, that you have found as the coach that your, your center fielder and maybe your second baseman and your shortstop are struggling on shallow balls that are kind of in the gap in between them. Um, as coaches, we can channel that. So we're not just hitting it there every single time, but we can be moving the ball around the field in order for them to have to interact with one another, that space and time component. So that would be an example of, of kind of like what a small sided game would be in, in baseball. But really, it's just using the constraint sled approach uh, to where you're, you know, you're trying to constrain to afford. So these behaviors that are occurring uh, potentially are going to be beneficial for the athletes because it's what they likely would interact with um, in the game itself. And they be can become more attuned or adaptable to their environment. Perfect. And, and so, you know, speaking of that, there were, I, again, younger self, um, and, and things, I, I, guys, I, I, again, and, and Tyler, I've, I've tried a lot of different things and failed at a lot of different things and, and then reflected on it and tried to, to make it better. And so I went into this, this, you know, stage of where we only did like 30 foot BP where I'm just firing it in there and I'm mixing it. And, you know, and so we did this all winter long and then we got to the spring and it just, it didn't like, it didn't work like they we would see 85 and get blown away and my uh perceived timing from 30 feet was like 85 plus right and so i started thinking about it i'm like okay well the only thing that's different reaction time may be the same but what's different is the space between the pitcher's mound and the plate and there's a lot of stuff that goes on and so that's been my only real question about having these small sided games and then even individual work to, of where we're we're working on different things and we're working on timing. We're working on reaction times, but we also need to, the, to use the field because we have to have this open space uh, and be able to react with that with our brain and our eyes. And so am, am I, am I off on that? Or, or, I mean, what's your best, what's your best recommendation for representative design, but also not just with the reaction times, but also with space. 
So representative learning design, we're, we're touching on it. We've kind of been touching on it quite a bit throughout the call without actually mm -hmm. saying, without yeah, saying what it is. Yeah, let's go into it. Yeah. So, so with that, well, first off, it's, it's been around for, for quite some time. The ideas of representative learning design, representative task design, uh, Egon Brunswick in 1956, kind of like, Hey, we're going to have to act, you know, interact with this information. So let's, let's look into ways in which the, the humans can, can interact with this information. And he mm -hmm. was, he was not a sport coach by any means, sure. you know, being a psychologist. But with that being said, um, with us as coaches, if once again, they need to become attuned to information they're going to perceive in the mm -hmm. game. And you're, you're talking about manipulating spaces as far as the distances between the, the pitcher and the hitter. And all of those are fan. Is that what you were talking about earlier? Yeah. I, so what I did was I shortened the distance to help with reaction time, which I think it did help with reaction time. But also mm -hmm. I think that we lose some different perceptual information whenever we move out from like 30 feet to 60 feet. Like it's a, it's a, it's a difference. So I only did one. And so I was saying, you know, it, to, to further your point, but you're getting into right. that already. Right. So the reason why, I, the reason actually why I like that now, I wouldn't do it all the time. Uh, it's actually a suggestion that I gave at the world pitching Congress back in uh, January this year. And I wrote a blog through emergence that's on our, on our website right now, um, actually that gives that as a suggestion. It doesn't mean that that's something you have in your drill box that you just go up there and do this with everybody. It needs to be right. relevant for that individual. And if it's for the pitcher hitter, whatever it may be, um, whenever we talking about like repetition without repetition approaches, once again, we're not, we're not needing for it to always be the exact distance or the same mound or the same weather conditions, because once again, we're not retrieving some action from memory anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, the action is essentially emergent based off of what is occurring around me at that moment in time. What, what is it, what is happening? And so with that being said, from a hitting perspective, the reason why I like that exactly why you just now said it is based off of, you know, the, the time to contact of that ball. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you use a reaction time with that. I mean, we're using information that is available uh, prior to the pitcher even starting their motion. So that mm -hmm. information is relevant as well, because if we were just purely reacting in most sports, we'd be in a, we'd be in a pretty tough spot. That's just a term that's used uh, often that we all, that we all use. But as far as manipulating that space, that part's brilliant. Now, you wouldn't want to just live there because that information, that's, that's information scaling. That might be too complex for that individual to interact with mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Sure. But that is an example um, right there of why a way in which one could potentially manipulate the constraints if they were, if they were going to be facing a team with a pitcher that threw, threw some smoke and they didn't want to use a pitching machine because, you know, it's not giving that body orientation of the pitcher, the arm slot's not available. Um, but that's one way you could actually increase the mm -hmm. speed of the pitch is moving up a little bit. But then there are also obviously they need to interact with the same space and time differences. So mm -hmm. as far as representative learning design, representative learning design at its heart, it needs to allow for actions that occur from uh, pitchers, hitters, fielders, whatever, that is like what is going to occur in the game. So if you as a coach are analyzing behavior from of your athletes and it starts to all of a sudden go that that probably wouldn't, he wouldn't do that in a game. Well, we, we need to probably change our practice activity. And it doesn't mean we have to, it just means we need to start considering, is there a way in which we could potentially encourage a similar type behavior to emerge without prescribing it? Um, and that's kind of at its heart what representative learning design is, because that fidelity, um, uh, it's termed action fidelity, but it's also fidelity amongst the system, is so important because we need that to be something that will be similar to uh, what the athletes will have. So that representative learning design, that's where context comes into play. Uh, that's essentially where you have functional variability that comes into play and functional meaning it, it helps solve the task. So mm -hmm. representative learning design is us as coaches creating something that is more contextual. Sure. And uh, while you're at it, while we're talking about uh, past me that has learned from my experiences, machines all the time don't work either. Like it's, it's again, there's so much, there's so much that goes into it and we can try and be as, as representative as we want, but nothing is so good that we have to do it every single day. Because I, again, I went like 30 feet, fired it in there. That wasn't great because once we got to a game, we saw space a machine. It's the same thing because the spin rate is not exactly the same. And there are some machines that are out there that are better. But uh, for me, I think it's just finding balance and finding, and I, I think this is what you were just hitting on, of the challenge point, but also trying to find different ways and to teach those with the reps without reps conversation that you talked about as well. And, and I thought that that was, that was really good. But an, another thing that I'm really trying to get into, and I, and I mentioned the small sided games, but also just immediate feedback loops. 
Uh, and so we talk about constraints led approach, uh, which is basically meaning, hey, here's how we solve the task. When you solve the task, uh, this is what it should look like. And so uh, trying to get them to understand, okay, this is the object for me, a former teacher, this is the objective. And I, again, I don't, I don't care how you necessarily get there, but here's what it looks like whenever you accomplish that. So it not only gets the buy-in from them, they're like, oh, competition, cool. Here's what I have to do to complete this. But it also, it, it should be training what we want them to see. Uh, and so I've been trying to do more and more of activities that have immediate feedback, like for the player. So they understand, okay, this is what it feels like when I do it wrong. This is what it feels like when I do it right. Let me do it right more, right? So what, what's your advice on us as baseball coaches to try and shorten the, those feedback loops as much as possible? So yeah, that's a that's a huge question and a great question. Uh, right, there are probably yeah. a lot out there that are that are better able to answer that than myself. But I the way the way that uh, we view uh, feedback number one is kind of viewing it more as information and information just available to the system. And we have as you think about our perceptual systems, uh, our our ability to perceive information or interact with that information, and in efforts for those those behaviors to emerge in a way in which will be you know the body self organizes and these tendencies. Um, you know, we have these emergent tendencies between perception and action uh, that, are, that are called uh, intrinsic dynamics or essentially mm -hmm. the way in which the, the body can allow for a behavior to unfold. And, and if someone's mm -hmm. not experiencing that, uh, that, that ability for them to uh, have that occur in real time is not going to be you know, very great. So as far as the feedback itself, you know, you're, you're speaking to a couple different types. One kind of being external feedback, external feedback okay. used heavily, heavily, heavily in the sport of baseball. Right. Uh, because baseball, golf, uh, probably a couple others, but those specifically have, you know, we have semi-motion and we have blast mode and we have all these different mm -hmm. companies that are out there that allow us to gather this information. That can be vitally important. Um, two things to, to bring up there. Number one is how we're capturing it uh, could be good or could be almost not even really that meaningful. And so if we analyze data and all of a sudden it's like, well, the data says this. Well, the data was also taking it out of context. So it's not really that relevant for, for me so as a coach. True. Mm -hmm. um, that's number one. Number two is, is, and this is my fear with it. And, and, uh, Rob's actually, Rob Gray, you mentioned him earlier in the call is, is uh, much more, uh, educated as far as being able to discuss this actually does it quite, quite nicely in one of his podcasts is, is different types of feedback. And so for me, uh, rather than me just giving him that copious amounts of feedback, as far as that external feedback from coach, mm -hmm. even if there is something I really would like to add, I need them to experience it themselves because I'm not sitting on their shoulder and they're in the box. Uh, and, oh, swing here. Mm -hmm. You know, like yep. their perceptions are different. Their action capabilities are different based off of what they're perceiving. Um, so with that being said, I may actually take, uh, you know, a, a couple of repetitions off. Let's call it that. And so I'm giving them a summary type feedback or summary information from the situation at hand. That way that we're not just, you know, just kind of destabilizing their ability to even interact with the world around them. And so that summary type feedback, it could be a deal where uh, if, the, if it's a pitcher and you're looking for certain spin rates, you're looking for a certain velocity, whatever it may be, the command's pretty apparent, it's right there, but certain like velocities, um, we don't need to know every single time as a pitcher, how hard did I throw that? Or what was my spin rate? But all of a sudden, if the coach, if I'm there as a coach and I'm looking at it and it was something different, I may say, hey, Johnny, that's, uh, that's interesting. How'd you feel about that pitch? Mm -hmm. I, I'm bringing attention to it because something may have been different, whether it be for, for good or for, you know, for bad. And so I think that that external feedback can inundate the individual sometimes. So it is important. Yes. Uh, but that is also feedback to the system. It's also information to the system, no different than haptic information, no different sure. than visual information, audit, you know, mm -hmm. auditory. So all of that essentially is embedded in the system. And we talk about uh, dynamical systems, like we mentioned earlier, there essentially it's just interconnectedness. So rather than thinking about them as silos, is we think of them as, as systems and interconnected. And that's essentially, um, when you mentioned like feedback loops, that's essentially what that is, is an interconnected system and how they can interact based off of their perceptual awareness or their mm -hmm. attunement, uh, what they're seeing, what they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully that helps. I'm, I'm probably rambling a bit. But. No, no, I, I love that. I thought that was, that was really uh, beautifully put. put. Uh, so again, with whenever we're talking about um, really just skill development. Uh, one thing that I, I've been curious about too is, is one, let's, let's get into maybe some, some teaching. And, and obviously we've done uh, that with, with uh, constraining and, and self-organizing and trying to set up an environment uh, that, that closely mimics the game. Uh, but how do we know, how do we know if, 
if the movement that we want to see them in is like actually sticks. So you have it and it's like three or four reps and they're like, Hey, now I'm the world's best coach. I fixed this in like five minutes. It's going to stick for, then they get to the game and it just completely falls apart. Or we prescribe a drill for them and we see them struggling. How long do we give them to struggle within that? And just before we look at ourselves and go, it's probably not the right drill for them. You know what I mean? Cause Cause I think it's a balance between both of those. And I think it's a balance between, okay, they're going to struggle because it's different and they're trying to figure it out. But I also don't want them to spend a week trying to figure this out whenever we could try something different and they could be getting better in the process. So that's a fantastic question. There, there are so many parts of that. that I think we could discuss for, for a while, <laughs> but what, what you're, what you're, what you're speaking to there is, is that's the need for it not to be specific. There's not, there's not a, I know, you know, some out there may go, you may not like this answer, but the, the answer is there's not a one way to do it. You know, one okay. size fits all cookie cutter. I mean, I think most coaches realize quite frankly, that if we really want to impact our athletes ability levels, that they have to be at least subtly unique to them and, and individualized to them. Um, so, so with that, how do I know your question I think was, how do I know if um, the movement that is, that is occurring or that is emerging is, is, is quality or is going to potentially mm -hmm. be beneficial or when, when should I step in? Is that kind of the two? The two so, questions? so, so really just whenever we're, so let's say that you want to teach me something okay. and how do I know if it sticks long-term? Like how do I know if it's going to hold oh, okay. up over time? Okay. That's neat. So f first thing would be is that you, you view it across different time scales. And so as coaches, I have been guilty of this um, a number of times is we, we see something occur. We change something, we change a con we manipulate a constraint, you know, such as the boundary that's available, such as the spin, the count, whatever, whatever it may be for your sport. And all of a sudden an action emerges and we're like, ah, that's it. I got it. I, that was perfect. I'm, I got the, uh, the A plus award as a coach today. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, you may move on. And then all of a sudden in the game, you're like, well, we just worked on that. Why didn't you, why didn't you pull that action from your uh, friend of mine, Stuart Armstrong, so that's so your, many times. from your backpack? Why didn't you just pull that action from your backpack? Yeah. That's because it doesn't exist there. That means that they, they need to experience it a lot. And, um, so we, and we can't just evaluate it over a really short time scale. And so the, to answer your question, I personally, uh, there's, there's not a perfect answer to it. We have to analyze film often. And I understand because I don't work with just four people. I, I work in, in a facility. I also do have some individual clients that I do sometimes invest more time in based off of, mm -hmm. you know, how much they invest. But um, I analyze their behavior in their sport. And if we've been working on certain activities or we have been, I've been constraining to allow for the, you know, them to search their, uh, you know, uh, their landscape of, of opportunities in order for movements to emerge, and it start, I start to see that happen. happen that's where you have that functional variability, that ability for their system to organize in a variety of different ways. Um, and, and they essentially are able to have what we've all talked about, dexterity. And then if they don't, then I might need to look back to, well, why didn't it happen? Well, was it just a single situation? Maybe I evaluated it or a different context, or maybe Tyler, I don't have enough time to just let that happen for a couple of games. Well, I need to look back to I, we practiced one thing and all of a sudden it was really good. And then I, then I moved on to the next thing. Well, they're now not, a, they might not be attuned to it. They, they didn't experience it enough. They need to experience it in order to have that sensitivity to it. So in short, analyze film that is important, even if it's three minutes per person. I mean, it can be something small. Like what are the tendencies that we're seeing that are occurring, you know, from their perception, their action, everything. And then if it's their, if it's what's limiting or rate limiting their performance, I may need to then try to channel in opportunities for them to start to explore that before they can ever even exploit it in the game, you know? Right. And, and, and so, you know, if I struggle at, let's bring this into a practical setting for baseball. If I struggle at hitting the ball the opposite way, I just, I struggle with that. I can manipulate something as simple as I have them kind of just move around just, just ever so slightly in the box, like a tiny bit. I'm, I'm changing the space that's available. And if they struggle hitting the ball the opposite way, I'm just, you know, let's give this a shot, see how it feels. Now that the barrel of their bass is going to be coming through the zone in a slightly different way, and it may allow for them to start to work outside pitches in a different way, but I'm not telling them that they're coming on a regular basis. You know, if, we're, if that's the session intention is to uh, start to stroke the ball the opposite way well and, you know, barrel it up, then I may mix in some inside pitches. That way they're not just sitting there and just waiting on an outside pitch. They have to be aware of what's going on, the body orientation, the pitcher, the arm slot, the, you know, all of that. 
But with that being said, is that you're maybe channeling that more often in order for them to experience that more often because no one said that experience doesn't matter. Um, Nikolai Bernstein's talking talks to or sp spoke to dexterity is exercisable and it's the accumulation of life life experiences. And so, in order for that to occur often, we need to experience it often. And so, with that, analyze film. Uh, Carl Newell actually, it's funny you mentioned that. I, I glanced down at the bottom of my uh, notepad here. Uh, this, this quote by Carl Newell, who is essentially the founder of the constraints led approach back in the mid 80s, said mm -hmm. uh, about functional variability, uh, movement variability is functional if it ensures that action goals can be met by the individual. So action goals can be met by the individual such that performance is maintained as the constraints are changed. So as coaches, if we keep changing the constraints all the time, and all of a sudden the, the, the ability of that performer is just starting to drop off immensely, maybe it's becoming too complex. It's challenging their, their grip of that situation too much. So maybe we can keep the, uh, the constraints of being manipulated uh, in a little bit more subtle way. So it needs to emerge often. And often in baseball, three out of 10 times, that's pretty good often for me as a hitter. But in most sports, it needs to be far greater than that in order to have dexterity. Sure. And uh, really good job answering that. that. That was a really tough question. No, I, I thought you did a great job uh, with, within that too. So uh, I'm looking at the, at the uh, guys and gals that are on the show and then knowing the audience that listens to the show almost exclusively, well, I don't want to say exclusively, but let's say 80% are in a team setting, 60, 80%. So a, a major majority with all of this that we've talked about you and you work uh, at a facility that has a lot of players at one time, what would be your best advice on how we can apply these principles? And, and we, again, this could be another show in itself, but how can we best defy, uh, best apply some of the principles that we're talking about today with a group of individuals that we're working like with one to 10 or one to 20 ratio for coach to player? Great question. So f first off, I used to think that utilizing this approach, I needed to have less people. Mm -hmm. And specifically in my sport of football, it is harder with less people. And there may be times, uh, I want everybody to know out there, baseball, football, tennis, otherwise, there may be times where you do want fewer because you, you need to work on specific opportunities for that individual and design those opportunities um, through that a, a relationship. But most of the time, having more, specifically in football, I can create better slices of the game. I can have defenders. We all move differently. We all perceive differently. So you essentially go through that process of solving um, that problem time and time again, like bon Bernstein talked about. And from a baseball perspective, if I have one to 10, and, and there are a number of examples you can give, but let's say that uh, you have an individual that is, it's targeted maybe for him at the, at, for those particular repetitions. Maybe it's for a hitter. It doesn't mean that the pitcher is not getting work in. It doesn't mean that we couldn't even potentially have several different pitchers that are going to come in and throw balls in one given setting. Um, so you're not just kind of sidelining people and they're just sitting there waiting and you're not getting to as many people. Or if you do have um, the outfield that is needing to work on balls that are being hit to them, rather than them just having a coach just sit there and hit a ball to them, which is okay, that's okay. Why not have them in that setting to where you know you have maybe there isn't a right fielder that's present, maybe there's not a you know there's not certain fielders that are on the field, and then that individual that that's the hitter that you're working with, you're working on inside pitches, and the the half of the field that is that is there, you have part of the game that is available. And I know it's not a perfect, a perfect answer, but essentially you, you have more people at your disposable, uh, disposal. Let's use those people that are available. And there's, let's cycle some different pitchers in that are needing pen work and a little bit of exposure to that pressure, that anxiety, uh, to a hitter in the box. All of that stuff, like we talked about all earlier in the call, all of that stuff shapes the way in which they are going to uh, themselves behave whenever they're pitching in a game. So they need it as well. So even though it may be four, the hitter and uh, you're the pitcher yourself. You're as a pitching coach, you're talking to him like, Hey, we're, let's work on some inside. Let's work on moving the ball around the plate on inside pitches here. They get a chance to pick the pitch. The hitter may not know exactly what's coming. So that's good. But they also know that their intention is they're going to be working the ball, maybe to, you know, pull the ball. And so the ball may travel outside some, but it's oftentimes going to be an inside part of the plate. So now you have two, three, four individuals that are now getting relevant contextual work. And as a coach, I'm analyzing it to see what type of behaviors are unfolding. And if the hitter is, is being successful, going back to the, the Newell quote, 
um, a decent amount, then it's, it's probably good for a learning experience for them. And even if they're not being successful, learning is messy. And so it does take time. So hopefully that helps a little bit, but baseball, it, it can be done. I, what I have seen in baseball, I've seen it too often to where there aren't live pins that are thrown very often. Um, hitters are spending too much time on tees or just on front toss. Uh, there, there's, there's a lower level of representative of sports scale, going back to the representative learning design. And if we can have a fielder that's even there, even if the ball is not coming to them, that is going to change the intentions of the individual. So let's just at least sure. get them out there. Right, right. And, and again, it's, uh, I think that's really good. And, and it, again, we, uh, there are listeners who are listening to this. And even for me, sometimes whenever I look at, at the broad scope of things, it, it can be daunting like trying to incorporate this, but also take, take in mind, um, guys and gals, uh, we do things that are very similar to this. We just call it different things. And we hit on that earlier today. So really just taking the approach of, okay, what do I do that's already closest to this? And then do that more. I mean, that, that can be an, an easy way to do that. You, you bring up something. I just, I, sorry, I apologize for jumping. No, in. absolutely. It's a crucial point where I do want to make this very apparent to listeners. If you think, you know, I'm hearing what you're hearing today, I'm sure you might like some of it. Some of it you're like, that sounds kind of crazy. Well, the, the fact about it is, and I, you know, I've mentioned football. I used to have athletes run through ladders. They used to run around a cone. And I realized pretty quickly that number one, they don't behave like that in their sport. And time is a limitation. And they're what they're essentially becoming attuned to with their head down on the ground or, or you know, twirling around, dancing around a cone or a ladder isn't really that beneficial for them. So I, I myself, I, I couldn't, I, it was hard for me to just go up. Oh, I'm throwing all of that away. I'm not going to use it at all. Try to change one thing, change one thing, maybe two things. If you're a little bit more comfortable with it, change a few things. It can be from practice to practice. Uh, you can maybe start to even just ask the athlete, Hey, you know, so what, what have you them to interact with but maybe what they are interested in interacting with because their perceptions are important so i just wanted to jump in and say that that i think i have a unstable connection here hopefully no you're good now better? you froze okay, for a now. second but you're good now okay uh so essentially it's important you know i i, I need for them to to have um, buy-in and ownership as well and as a coach it doesn't mean i have to do a complete 180 and i'm completely different than i was doing before because a lot of times we as coaches were doing some really good stuff uh, let's just make subtle changes to where it maybe is something that is going to shape the content even better. Sure. And, and I've, I've been so guilty of that, of hearing some really new cool stuff and then trying to implement it way too fast or trying to implement it all at once. And then, then just honestly getting burnt out and then just going back to what I, what I did before. But um, for me lately, it's just been a time of, of ref during this time of, of COVID-19 for those listening, you know, a year from now, uh, we're doing that then and, and just taking this time to reflect on some of those different aspects that I'm doing well, but also, okay, I'm, I'm attending a zoom a day or doing podcasts with Tyler and, and different things like this. Okay. So how, how can I actually use this rather than just listening to it and going, okay, that was cool. I'm going to write it down and then never see it again. And that's been something for me that, that I've really, I've got to do a better job of and understanding how, how can I implement this where I'm at right now in the best way possible. And uh, so uh, before you go, I know that, that there are so many different things that we can that we could cover. We could probably do this on a daily basis and not cover as much as you wanted to. Um, but I, for for the listeners who are wanting to dig more into some different things that, that you talked about, I mean, we used a, a, a lot of uh, skill acquisition words um, and and a lot of phrases and a lot of concepts from that. What are your best resources that uh, that we, that you would recommend and, and two that, two that I would like to throw out there that are fairly, that are fairly, uh, easy. Well, I don't want to say easy reads, but fairly digestible reads. Uh, one is nonlinear pedagogy and another one is just the constraints based approach. And then that they actually had a, have a, had a new copy that was written this last year. And then they're going to do one at some point in baseball, which would be great. But Besides those two, are there, and, and again, reading into those, uh, half of the time I was like, okay, I've got to Google what this word actually means. But um, once you start to, to get their vocabulary, it starts to make a lot of sense. But are there any that you would like to throw out there that, that you really liked um, that, that we, could help us to understand the concepts a little bit better? Yeah, there are quite a few. I, th I think the first thing to mention, you mentioned the concepts. I think that those, those things are important because it does shape 
the way in which we design our practices. And if what we truly hope for is, is uh, you know, more skillful performance for our individuals, then we have to have a good understanding of the theoretical underpinnings in order for us to be able to design relevant opportunities for them to engage with. So I do think that they're meaningful. Um, I'm very fortunate, very, very fortunate because a lot of the individuals from the two books that you just mentioned. So first of them, it's actually funny you mentioned those two because those are two of my five. Uh, would be Nonlinear Pedagogy and Skill Acquisition. Uh, it's by Chow and colleagues. And then uh, the constraints led approach by Renshaw, Davids, Roberts, and uh, Newcomb. Um, I'm actually going to be starting in September my uh, doctorate at the University of Gloucestershire in, in England with Will Roberts, who is one of the, uh, the uh, authors awesome. of the constraints led approach. And so uh, I'll be doing it on a representative learning design in, in American football and using a constraints led approach. Uh, mm -hmm. And so pretty stoked about that. I think those two books are, are, are massive, massive ads because they are easy reads, but they make you read it. And you're like, huh. Well, that, well, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, or, or, you know, and, I, and I've used a lot of the ideas from that today. Um, Dynamics of Skill Acquisition is a, a little bit more challenging read, but uh, by David's Bennett and Button from 2008, that was probably one of the, probably one of the best ones early in the 2000s. So Dynamics of Skill Acquisition, uh, Dexterity and Its Development uh, by Nikolai Bernstein. So Dexterity and Its Development uh, up there. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't add and, and uh, humbly add um, emergence, the content that we put out through, through um, our company is essentially a, you know, a conglomeration of, of most all of these books and, and papers and uh, podcasts. And so essentially myself um, and Sean Mishka and Michael Zwiefel, Garrett Boyum and Jared Sigman, uh, the five of us through Emergence have, have put together this content that is available online and their, their courses to essentially uh, define the underpinning theories of, of ecological dynamics and, and nonlinear pedagogy, and not to try to give everyone all the answers, but kind of in much in the same way as this, as this podcast to provide maybe some ideas and thoughts of how we can make it more relevant for our individuals. And then we also have how you can extend this approach into the weight room, like how this could be beneficial and meaningful in the weight room. And we currently have three courses that are, that are close to completion, one of which actually is a baseball specific course. And uh, we, we have uh, hopes and, and ideas for um, a number of other courses uh, being more specific and, and showing how to actually use these ideas. But um, our, our courses through Emergence, which is Emergent Movement, M-V-M-T, EmergentMovement.com, uh, would be my fifth, my fifth suggestion. And, and uh, they're by no means all of my ideas. They are just the ways in which we have interpreted to apply them. And, and so those would be my, my five. Awesome. Well, um, for our podcast listeners who want to get in touch with you, um, what would be the best way to do that online? Uh, probably just our, our social media. I mean, our email okay. would work too, but social media. So we're, we're primarily active on Twitter and Instagram. And we, we just started as a company in October. So we're relatively new, but we've been doing this for, for uh, quite some time. Our, our form of life continues to, to shift and change. And um, so it's E-M-E-R-G-E-N-T. MVMT, Emergent Movement. And uh, Josh very gracious, graciously um, just now posted down there. He just went through our, our main course titled Underpinnings. And thank you, Josh. I appreciate that. It's, um, it's, it's our main theoretical course that's available and essentially kind of getting more clarity to these ideas and what they can mean to you. But uh, Emergent Movement on Twitter, Instagram, we are on Facebook. And then our website is the same, uh, emergentmovement.com. We have a blog series that's available, and uh, we, I think there are two or three that are baseball-specific blogs that you guys are uh, feel free to read. And, and so we're, we're very, very gracious that we've had the opportunity to interact with some brilliant people out there. Um, I see Kathy's on the call here. She's wonderful. She has uh, – she's Panther Flows on Instagram, and that's where she's the most uh, you know, active. And then on, on uh, Twitter, she is Intrinsen. I would highly suggest giving her a follow. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. And not to give her too much of a, a shout out, but she is very bright. So I would, I would highly encourage you guys following <laughs> Kathy as well. Cool. We'll just get her on the podcast here right whenever you're done. And then we'll just roll from there. You guys better get your pens ready. She's got a lot of, <laughs> add, a lot of things to add. I love that. Well, if you've got some time, uh, we did have a couple of questions uh, on the sidebar. And, and again, it's, it's, uh, it's, if you guys have any, throw them, throw them in there. But Zach wanted to know, he said, what would be an example of information you would, you would give in a constraint drill? In other words, what would you tell the players when you set up the drill so that you don't give them information overload? 
Good question. Good question. Good question, Zach. It could be something as simple as just defining the task. You know, what is our intention for this session? One, one of the things that I have on my own personal checklist as far as when I design when my learning environments is, is what is, the in, what is the intent for that particular task? It may be the same as the overall day, or it could be different from task to task. So it could be something as simple as, you know, we're, we're looking to work the ball to the outside part of the field here today. Uh, we're going to do a variety of different things. Doesn't mean that's what you do every time. You know, the signing an action by any means, but it's kind of more that's what you're aiming to interact with. And um, as far as the information that's available, remember that information can be uh, a number of different things. Um, it can be the count that you're changing. Um, it can be it can be the uh, the backdrop that is available to the hitter. You know, behind them. It can be the amount of the uh, amount of the defenders in the field that are that are shaping that behavior. It can be the weight of the bat. It can be like slightly moving them around in the box a little bit, just allow them to explore different options. It can be um, essentially you pausing after maybe five or six repetitions and saying, uh, do you, you know, what are, what are you feeling there? What are you seeing there? What are you experiencing? You know, oh, I'm noticing this and that. Well, maybe, maybe try your, your gaze focusing in the center of my chest for a bit. And just see, see, what, see what happens from there. You know, when you're educating their attention and uh, a lot of the research has shown it, it moves out to the end effector. So essentially you're, you're perceiving body orientation of the pitcher uh, mm -hmm. from kind of their, their midsection area. And they're going to just naturally move out to the end effector, which is essentially the arm that's releasing the ball uh, versus it being they're staring at a spot that there's, no, there's not really much information that's coming from. So essentially you're gathering more information or perceiving more information. So that'd be, that'd be one example. How, how much do you get into gauge, gaze behavior? Because it's something that I'm trying to dig more and more into. And I really, I found some stuff. Driveline has done some cool stuff with it. And uh, there's been some cool stuff with cricket, but there's not a whole lot of information out there. So do you, have you done much research on it? I've done a, done a fair amount. It's, it's by no means the area that I would say I'm the expert in that area by any means, but uh it is something I've spent a fair amount of time with, certainly. Um, I think the, the overwhelming, overwhelming amount of evidence uh, shows that uh, most people think that, that uh, expert individuals are essentially like focusing in one particular spot, and that's actually not what the research shows. It shows that they're, they're scanning, um, so they, they're moving their eyes around the, you know, the area, and they are picking up information from everywhere to essentially guide their behavior. Uh, that can be sometimes challenging for, for a young learner because they are they're inundated with that information. So right. uh, not telling them, Sean Mishka, who I've mentioned, part of Emergence, mm -hmm. uh, s says this in a, in a really, really nice way, is not, not necess necessarily telling them what to see, but maybe where to look. So they're still, you know, their search process is still guided there, but it might be kind of the example I just gave, like, you know, maybe just for the next 10 pitches, just kind of mm -hmm. start your gaze on kind of somewhere on my midsection. You know, you're not saying mm -hmm. here, right shoulder, there, or the other. Um, and then in one of the books, in one of the books that uh, we talked about, I think it was a constraints led approach book. It was talking about professional tennis players and uh, they were essentially couldn't beat, couldn't beat this tennis player. And it may have been Agassi a couple of, but couldn't beat this tennis player. And through searching and searching and searching both on film and person, everything found out that there was a, it was a subtle difference in essentially where the opponent's tongue was pointing, whether they're going to serve down the middle or whether they're going to uh, serve to the, to the outside part of the, uh, box and so if it was going to be down the middle the tongue would kind of point directly out a little bit and if the serve was going to be wide it was out so how would how would I pick up that information if I'm staring at their belt the whole time you know at, for for a uh, field-based sport so essentially going back to that gaze behavior I do need to scan in order to pick up information and as the coach we can still guide that but once again we need to know that athlete fairly well we need to work with them we need to actually ask them what they see what they hear what they feel and um, so that part is important. And the other thing I'll add to that, I actually don't have it pulled up. If you guys bear with me, I think it's called, it's by Williams, Williams and Davids, I believe. Let me actually, if you guys will bear with me for just a moment, I'll actually pull sure. it up here and I'll Absolutely. tell you the, uh, so probably one of the best books out there on this subject, in my opinion, is by, let's see, Visual Perception and Action in Sport. It's by Williams, Davids, and Williams. So Keith Davids, kingpin in the industry. Uh, I'm fortunate to have him as my external supervisor for my doctorate. Uh, it, perception and action in sport, or excuse me, visual perception and action in sport, 19, uh, 1990s there. That's probably one of the best books out as far as gaze and gaze behavior and things of like that, in my opinion. Uh, Kathy can drop some in the box if she wants to add as well. 
No, I love that. And, and I, I appreciate that. And, and that's something that, again, I think we talk about it a lot, but really digging into, you know, timing and pitch recognition. And I, I think we're just scratching the surface on that, but you did have one more question. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is from Matthew, Matt, thanks for coming on the show. I have, he comes on just about every one of them. So I appreciate awesome. that. But he said, me, baseball man. has two, <laughs> he said, baseball has two seasons, off season and regular season. Off season, more focus on individual skills. Would you agree that regular season should focus more on facilitation of specific situations where the mind, body, where the body and mind work on self organization? And he says, thank you. All right, let me just read. So it. one more Let's time. Again. Let's see. Off yeah, just scroll up just a little bit. So I think that the first thing I would add to it. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Matthew is I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't separate them out completely. I think that there's the need to work on both. That's a really good question. The fact that uh, if you don't mind, I'll give you, I'll give you a football example and then try to tie it into baseball. So if I have athletes that come to me in late May, early June, uh, that, are, that are college athletes or potentially already have some of my pro guys at that time, I, I'm not gonna just work on just acceleration at that time, or I'm not gonna just work on just their strength capabilities. Although I may have situations that are more of a 1v1 situation, if it's a receiver and a defensive back, it may be the receiver working on releases. You know, it may be the receiver working on uh, creating space out of their, out of their routes um, in order to create separation to, to receive the ball. Maybe I'm throwing or having a quarterback that's available. Maybe it's a 1v2 situation. So they're, in fact, working on a lot of their releases, their perceptual strategies, their, their ability to accelerate. But it's not fully contextual like it would be for, uh, for a sport or like a 7-on-7 seven seven or anything like that. Um, but I'm also going to spend more time on, and, and the term is effectivities, essentially the capabilities or capacities of an individual. Um, you know, it may be something that's limiting their performance, such as strength capabilities or, or rotational capabilities. So I may spend more time dabbling in that area. But then to your point, yes, I, I, I certainly would agree that the specific situations that are going to allow for that attunement through body and mind, you know, uh, performer environment relationship to occur, it needs to be spending uh, hopefully a fair amount of time on that. Uh, during that time of the year otherwise they're they're going to go in into the the games and they're going to look very uh let's say just disorganized or out of sync because they haven't experienced information that's relevant to their game or or not as relevant i should say so kind of mix both in but if it's earlier off season uh, a little bit maybe a little bit less specific but remember i mean i would suggest using that representative of uh, level of sports scale like a one to ten you don't need to be in a seven to a 10 all the time in the earlier off season. It can be in those, you know, those little snippets of the game. Uh, maybe it's not a, a batter in the box, an umpire present, fielders on the field, a pitcher that's there, but maybe it is mm -hmm. more live pins. Okay. That way that they're starting to perceive ball flight information, body orientation. But then as the season approaches, much in the same way, the whole reason we would play spring training, um, you know, that, that part is, that part's important. Uh, but we sure. can't just rely on that being the teacher. But that's kind of what's occurring during that time of the year. And I'm not a, obviously baseball is not my number one sport. Jonathan, mm -hmm. you guys can speak better to that. No, I thought that was really, really good. Uh, but Tyler, I appreciate your time, man. I and I really encourage uh, everyone to to go to uh, Emergence and obviously um, the new one that you're that you're working out, the Starter Sports. That'll be cool. Uh, hopefully, yeah, so you guys will start some baseball stuff there. Will you start writing blogs and some different stuff, or did I just miss those on there? No, no, we're ju we're just now starting, and we will start to have those available. And I'd be remiss okay. if I didn't mention that um, I, the, my position there. You can call me whatever you want. I don't care. It doesn't matter that they. Uh, the uh, individuals who started the company, they, they want my title to be director of athlete learning. And so my position kind of scales into different levels. So uh, my, my you know, area of expertise being motor learning control, that area, but also mm -hmm. I, my, my background is in strength and conditioning. And so okay. I don't just view it though as just the weight room. I think that there's, there's far more that can be done uh, from you know, uh, the training perspective or the conditioning. You know, I've got air quotes up the conditioning 100%. 100%. side. Uh, there, there's a lot that's left out. But my, my role is to essentially work with the other sport coaches. Josh is actually one of them. He's on the call. Uh, he's a hitting coach for us. Working with him to where I'm sitting in or near the cage while he's got hitting lessons that are going on. And I'm not going, oh, no, 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 we're not doing that today. It's mm -hmm. more um, we get together afterwards and we are collaborating based off the why, maybe of what is selected. And uh, we're working towards being able to put out more relevant data. So certainly keep an eye out for that because we're tr trying to get the point to where um, we, can, we can start to put out information that is going to help other coaches. And we don't have all the answers by any means, but I know we do have the common thread of we're all in this together to help one another. And mm -hmm. um, 
Thank you so much, by the way, for having me on the call. This has been a lot of fun. It's good for me too, by the way, to, to exercise these ideas in an area that is it's not my number one sport. So uh, to all the listeners out there, I graciously appreciate you know, the, the um, you know, attentiveness of you. And Jonathan, thank you so much for having me on.